So my topic uh, this morning is the threefold office of Christ and Christians. Let me begin with a question. Why are you called a Christian? And I do not mean that you in the general sense of all of you together here as a group. I mean this you in the sense that the Catechism uses it. Personally, you individually. Why, whether you are a professor here, or whether you are a retired laborer, whether you are a young person, whoever you are, my question to you is, why are you called a Christian? And I give you a few seconds to think about that. Now the answer of the Catechism is familiar to us. Because I am a member of Christ by faith and thus share in His anointing so that I may as prophet confess His name, as priest present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to Him, and as king fight with the free and good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. This is one of the answers in the Catechism that makes that turn from the more general we to the very personal I, because I am a member of Christ by faith and so on. So, question and answer 32 bring us right to the heart of what it means to be a Christian on the basis of what it means that Christ has that title. I wonder if we still recognize how radical Lord's Day 12 of the Catechism is. First of all, in the 16th century. And the Catechism was published in 1563. It goes without saying that the dominant church on the scene was still the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church, it was very clear who the priests were. Number one, all the priests were male. Number two, all the priests were part of the clergy. And there was a clear division between the clergy and the laity, all the rest. Now, Here comes this radical, upstart catechism called the Heidelberger. And it dares to announce in that context that every single genuine believer, male and female, younger and older, is a priest. Imagine that. A church of priests. Rather a radical thought, wouldn't you say? Doesn't stop there. What about prophets? In the 16th century, there was a rather well known group of prophets called the Zwickau prophets. They didn't have a very good reputation. In German, they were known as the Schreimer, which means the radicals, the enthusiasts. They were known to be a little bit on the fringe of the mainstream Christian church. And now, here again comes the Heidelberg Catechism, and it says, not only do we have a few prophets, maybe there in Zwickau or Münster, but we have a church just filled with all kinds of prophets. That even, in a sense, out-radicalizes the radical Reformation. And then to top it all off, The Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 12, is so audacious as to say that genuine, true believers are kings. What? We've been traveling, a group of us have been traveling around Germany and the Netherlands for the last little little while, and especially in Germany we've seen a lot of castles, a lot of palaces, where all these Kings or queens and princes and princes and nobility live, and it's all very impressive. You're at the castle, but Bentheim. 
But in the 16th century, it would have been very clear. These people are nobility. They're princes. They're princesses. You can see it on their clothes. But the vast majority of the rest of the people, they're, they're the peasants. They're not royalty. And now here comes the catechism. And it says that all genuine, sincere believers, even a peasant, every Hans, Peter, and Klaus, is a king. Can this be tolerated in the 16th century? How about the 21st century? Let me ask you another question. When you woke up this morning and got ready, looking in the mirror, combing your hair, trimming your beard, as the case may be, as you were sitting down for breakfast, did you at any point this morning think, now, here I am, starting another day as a prophet, or as a priest, or as a king? You may have thought, here I start another day as a conference goer. Here I start another day as a member of a tour group. Here I start another day as a tour organizer. But did any one of us consciously think that we hold threefold office and thus we begin our day? Maybe Lord's Day 12 is not only radical in the 16th century, maybe it's just as radical today. This morning I'd like to take you more deeply into this thought, the radical threefold office of Christ and the Christian by focusing on first three things. First of all, we want to look at the catechism in connection with, comparison with, a number of other catechisms on the threefold office of Christ and the Christian. Then we want to look at the Bible for biblical support of this teaching. And then finally, how it applies to life. So first of all, the Heidelberg Catechism and other catechisms then to the scriptures, then to practical life. In order to not take too long about the comparison section with other catechisms, I've made a chart that I'll bring up here. It's not magic or anything like that, just so so that we wouldn't be distracted. I looked in a number of catechisms in the 16th and just to the end towards the 17th century. This is not a complete comprehensive list. This is a representative list. And not only do I give the name and maybe in there the author and the area from which it came or was used, but also what did it say about Christ and his office and then what about the Christian and his office with a few other uh, explanatory or interesting notes. Now, I'm not going to go in detail about each catechism. I just want to show you a number of things looking at the big picture. First of all, if you look on the column of Christ as, and you follow it through chronologically, I've set it up from the earliest, uh, or the earlier catechisms, 1528, right up until 1648. If you look initially, there seems to be some hesitation about speaking of the threefold office of Christ or particularly Christ as prophet. Two important catechisms, the Württemberg Catechism written by Johannes Brenz, also from this area around here, clearly mentions Christ as king and priest but not as prophet. Same thing for Calvin's first catechism. But then with Calvin's perhaps more widely used and known Geneva Catechism, There, for the first time, we have the threefold office of Christ, king, priest, and prophet in that particular order. And there, or from that point, you see consistently thereafter, each of the catechisms refers to Christ and his threefold office. So the first thing we can conclude is though there was some initial hesitation, Christ and his threefold office became a firm part of Reformed doctrine, including as it is summarized in the catechisms. Concerning the Christian, though, the picture is a lot more all over the map. 
The first few catechisms, there's no mention of it. It comes a little bit in Calvin's first catechism, more fully in the second catechism. Alasco, just two of the offices, or two parts of the office. It's, somewhat surprisingly, not there in Erzinus' smaller, although, to his credit, it is fully there in the larger. Sorry that it got split up, but the uh, king is there, and then the priest and prophet is up on the top of the next page. Heidelberg has it, of course, but then, if we go to the more English-British tradition, you notice that in the widely used Craig's Catechism, it speaks of Christians as priests. But then, it disappears. And in the shorter and larger, although we have the threefold office of Christ clearly explained, there's no reference to the threefold, no explicit reference to the threefold office of the Christian. And therefore, if you just look at this brief overview, I would like to conclude by saying that I think we should be deeply thankful for how well-rounded, how robust the teaching of the Catechism is on the threefold office of Christians. And remember that Frederick III wanted the youth to understand this. Yes, everyone, but for that special vision for the youth. What is it for the youth of the church when they clearly understand that I'm not just Hans, Peter, Klaus, Jane, Sophia, or Mary, but that I am, in Christ, believing sincerely, prophet, priest, and king. Well, it is a very full explanation, but is it biblical? There was a professor back in 1956, Dr. J.F. Jansen, who maintained that the whole aspect of Christ as prophet and the Christian as prophet is really not found in the Bible and therefore should not be there in the Catechism. His words were the following, It's an artificial change to add the prophet, which does not find warrant in his own biblical theology. He was speaking then of Kelvin, who first introduced it. And therefore he concluded, it's rather an embarrassment than a help, because it's not in the Bible, he said. Well, that brings us to the second part of this lecture, and that is the biblical support for the threefold office. And then in particular, we're going to look at the biblical support for Christ as prophet and teacher, and the Christian as prophet and teacher. We'll include the others, but especially on that uh, one that Jansen doubted. So as we turn to Scripture, we first of all look at Christ as King. Now, there really should be no controversy here. Kings in the Old Testament were anointed. David was anointed by Samuel. Solomon was anointed by Zadok. Furthermore, the Lord made a covenant with David, and particularly that one of his sons would rule on the throne forever. That is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul also confirms this when he declares the Son of God to be the one who descended from David according to the flesh, Romans chapter 1. So, when you put all of that together, there's no need to doubt that according to Scripture, Christ holds the office of anointed king. But what do we understand, scripturally speaking, about what it is to be king? Again, those of us who have been on the tour have seen a lot of these beautiful and historic castles. We're actually in one now, more or less, right? This is part of an old castle. And I think that's what we associate with kings and, and royalty and nobility. Beautiful castles, servants waiting on you, hands and hand and foot, and nice silver platters. Let me read to you one description in the Bible of Christ as king. Revelation 19. 
There in Revelation 19, the verses 11 through 16, Christ is described literally as the King of Kings. So what's he doing? Sitting on a nice plush chair, receiving food on a silver platter? No, he's on a white horse. He's riding out into a battle. There's an army behind him. Army of heaven. Beautiful clothes? Well, says the scripture, verse 12, his robe is dipped in blood. Why? There's a battle going on. And what is his mouth filled with? The golden tongue of eloquence? Well, certainly, our Savior is eloquent. But verse 14 says, his mouth is filled with a sharp sword. Christ is a king who fights with a sword on the battlefield of this life. Is that how you think of Christ your king? That's how the Bible speaks of him. Turn to the office of priest. Again, it's rather easy in Scripture to establish that Christ is the great high priest. The Old Testament priests were anointed. Christ means anointed. Aaron was anointed by his younger brother Moses. And by the command of the Lord, so were all the sons of Aaron as well. Then you have that well-known psalm, Psalm 110. And it declares that, prophetically, declares that Jesus Christ, the one coming, is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now here, concerning the threefold office, you have something very intriguing. Because Melchizedek was not only a priest, mentioned in Genesis 14, he was also the king of Salem. So here you have a combination office already in the Old Testament, a king priest. And it is exactly this king priest, Melchizedek, that Jesus Christ fulfills. Hebrews chapter 7 and 8. So, it's very plain from Scripture, Jesus Christ is the priest king after the order of Melchizedek. But again, what do you think of when you hear about a priest? What does a priest actually do, scripturally speaking? We often think of the sacrifices, all the animal sacrifices, and that was correct. But you see, there were two altars. Not only the big bronze altar for the animal sacrifices, there was also the smaller golden altar with the incense, the prayers. Priests not only made animal sacrifices foreshadowing Christ on the cross, but priests also interceded in the prayers of God's people. And not only that, and this is the least well known, they were very important in teaching God's people. Look at Deuteronomy 33, verse 10. There we read concerning the descendants of Levi. They teach your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. That's actually task number one of the priest. Please note. Teach your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. Then, continuing, Deuteronomy 33, verse 10, they offer incense before you. Task number two, the prayers. And then, actually in the last position there in that verse, and offer whole burnt offerings on your altar. In other words, Scripture challenges us to have, again, a very full, a robust understanding of what it is that Christ is our priest. Then, the last one, and of course this brings us to the one that is most contentious, the one that Jansen, Dr. Jansen, doubted, and that is the prophet. Now we read, literally, explicitly, once of the anointing of a prophet. That was Elijah, who anointed his successor, Elisha, 1 Kings 19, for those of you who want the reference. And so it's often said, well, there's just that one little verse, 1 Kings 19, verse 16, that speaks about one prophet anointing another prophet, how can you take that and say that that all foreshadows Christ as prophet? It's just too small, too slim. Well, I would draw our attention to Isaiah 61. There, and I quote, 
Isaiah, under the inspiration of the Spirit, says, The Lord has anointed me, that's the servant of God, to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Preach, proclaim, proclaim. Those are prophetic tasks. And they're connected to the Lord anointing his servant. And not only that, but when Jesus got up and read and explained and expounded this chapter in his hometown of Nazareth, Christ said, Luke 4, verse 21, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, Jesus Christ said, I am here as the anointed one to proclaim the gospel. Good news. To me, that says that Christ was the anointed prophet. Isaiah 61, Luke 4. And then further, one more interesting detail from the Old Testament, and that is this, that David, the one whom we always associate as being the king of Israel, said at the very end of his life, 2 Samuel 23, he spoke an oracle, which was typical for the prophets to do, to speak an oracle. And he said, the spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. 2 Samuel 23. Again, this is the language of prophets. God's word on my tongue, out my mouth to the people. And there you see something like Melchizedek. That in David, there's a combination of king and prophet. And so I would contend that Dr. Jansen has not looked quite deeply enough in the scripture, and there is a clear indication in scripture that Christ is also our anointed prophet, and that we, as Christians, then share in that anointing. And it's striking to me that of all the aspects of the threefold office, that Jansen doubted that it was the prophet that was connected to the threefold office, because Was it not on Pentecost Day, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, that Peter, quoting from Joel, the prophet Joel, said that now all of God's people are prophets? Acts 2, verse 18. Even on my servants, please note, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they will Prophesy. This is what Pentecost announced. That God's people are now prophets. They are to prophesy. And so, if we look at the scriptures, we can come to the conclusion that the Heidelberg Catechism is not making things up. It's it's not off the mark here. It's deeply rooted in the word of God. And that's actually literally what the word radical means. When we think of the word radical, we think of someone way off in the left field. They're, they're way off in the fringe somewhere. But really, radical, radex, means rooted. So yes, I suggest to you that the catechism is radical. It's radically scriptural. It's rooted in the word of God when it speaks about the threefold office of Christ and Christian. Well now... We need to make the connections to daily life. That's the third part of this talk. And along the way, we're going to have help from three different sources. The first is the catechism itself. For each one, for prophet, priest, and king, I want to look at Lord's Day 12 compared to some of the other Lord's Days to fill in some of the picture a bit more. Then we'll also, the second help is to go to Erzinus' larger and smaller catechism just a couple of times and see how that can fill in the picture a bit. And then finally, from the hand of Olivianus, we have this delightful little book. Um, Dr. Birma has called it in the subtitle, uh, and forgive me if I quote the subtitle a little bit incorrectly, but it's something like a helpful guide or helpful aid to interpreting the catechism. This document from Olivianus is called the uh, Festergrund, 
firm foundation. And it's, uh, it's maybe like a little bit of an expansion or commentary on a section of the Catechism, including Lord's Day 12. So we'll bring that in, too, to uh, shed a little bit more color on our topic. So we'll go through them one by one, starting with the prophetic office of Christ and the Christians. Lord's Day 12 says, Christ, as my chief prophet and teacher, has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption. Teacher, you scan through the catechism in your mind. Can you identify the first Lord's Day that speaks about teaching? You don't have to go too far. You find it in Lord's Day 2. It was referenced in the last speech by Dr. Horton that Christ teaches us what the law is in the summary. You should love the Lord your God, you love your neighbor as yourself. So right when the catechism gets into teaching you and me just how miserable, remember it's how great, not just that I am a sinner, not just that I am miserable, but if I'm really going to appreciate salvation, I have to understand how great my sin and misery is. And whom does the catechism bring, so to speak, up to the lectern, up to the front of the classroom, to teach all of us what a wretched man or woman I really am? There he stands, Christ, your chief prophet and teacher. Christ teaches. You see the link between Lord's Day 2 and Lord's Day 12? And what better teacher could you possibly have? I know, learning about how great your sin and misery is, that's not a necessarily pleasant process. But if there's anyone who can do an absolutely superlative job of it, who can comprehensively, who can with conviction, but also with tender mercy and compassion, teach you just how sinful you are, then it's Christ. But not only does he teach us the bad news about ourselves, he also is intricately involved, of course, in the good news. That brings us to Lord's Day 6. From where do we know about this mediator and deliverer? Starts already in the Old Testament... God himself first revealed his deliverance in paradise, Lord's Day 6, the end, question and answer 19. Later he had it proclaimed by the patriarchs and the prophets, foreshadowed by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law, and then here it comes, finally he had it fulfilled through his only sons, through his only son. And I want to emphasize that full fills. You see, in Lord's Day 12, you have that same word again. That Christ, our chief prophet and teacher, has fully revealed. Well, if something is full, it's full. You don't top up a full glass, it's full. And so, in Christ, we have the fullness of the revelation of deliverance. You don't need to sneak in a little bit more to top it up. Or to add a few more footnotes. With our chief prophet and teacher, the epoch, the era of partial is done with. And now we've entered the era of fullness. And Olivianus, in that wonderful little document, the firm foundation, Fester Grund, applies that to us in a very concrete way. And I'm not going to paraphrase, I'm just going to quote, because I don't think I could say it better than he does. Olivianus says, so many sincere Christians are still wondering, what does God really think about me? The throne of heaven and God is considering me, what is going through his divine mind? Quote, Olivianus, how then can a person doubt and say, How can I know how God feels about me? For the Son himself, to whom the disposition, the will, 
the mind of the Father are thoroughly known, fully known, as revealed. The will and promise of the Father to us in the Gospel. Still quotation from Olivianus, he continues later. In this way, God shows us his heart. He shows us his mind. He lays it bare, as it were, in the Holy Gospel. In other words, end quote, you don't need to guess. You need to listen. You need to listen to the Gospel. And your chief prophet and teacher will tell you what God is thinking of you. Now, With that great blessing of Christ as our chief prophet and teacher, don't be surprised that when we, by faith, share in this anointing, it's going to be quite a task. Let's connect Lord's Day 12 with Lord's Day 36. Lord's Day 12 says that as prophet we must confess him. It's really short, actually. say, well, that doesn't sound too hard. That means that Wherever I am, I need to be willing to say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is my Lord, I confess him as my Savior. It's a good start. There's much more than that. Lord's Day 36. We must use the holy name of God only with fear, with reverence, so that we may, exactly the same words now, rightly confess him, call upon him, and doxologically praise him in all our words and works. That's a lot of territory. Every word that you've ever spoken, every work, deed that you've ever done, you are to do it confessing the Christ, you are to do it prophetically. Have you done that? Have I done that? No. So that's why we pray. Lord's Day 47, first petition. Hallowed be your name, the connection of the name. And what is it to pray, hallowed be your name? That is, grant us first of all that we may rightly know you, sanctify, and now here's the connection back to 36, praise you in all your works. So, let's bring it together. To be a Christian prophet means... To rightly, knowingly, confess Christ in all our words and works by giving praise to all His words and works. And that's a big task. And I would humbly submit to you that in the Christian church today, we have too many who are content to remain kindergarten Christians. Now, I've got nothing against kindergarten. Our five-year-old son, Philip, is just chomping at the bit to start kindergarten. September is way too far away for him. Kindergarten's a good thing as a start. But then you have to go on and mature grade one, and so on. Hebrews 6, let us leave, but let's keep standing, let us leave the elementary teachings, the ABCs and the one, two, threes about Christ and go on to maturity. To be a Christian prophet, understood in the catechism itself, is a very full responsibility about knowing everything about God's words and works so that in all of your words and works, you can declare and honor his name. Wow. You've got more work to do than you realized when you came up the cable car this morning. But there's still the priestly office. I want to zero in on the intercession. Of course the cross and the sacrifice is important. I don't want to take anything away from that. But what is it that Christ, as the Catechism says there, answer 31, also intercedes before the Father for us? In fact, in Erzimus' Catechism, the larger one, he turns it around. Fascinating. What is Christ's priesthood? Answer 61 in the larger Catechism of Erzimus. 
It is his procuring of the Father's grace for us by his intercession and by the sacrifice of his obedience and death. So whereas the Heidelberg Catechism goes sacrifice, intercession, for Zionists in his larger catechism turns them around and goes intercession, sacrifice. And that's a good and that's a healthy balance because so many Christians today, they speak about the cross, they love Christ's sacrifice of the cross. Of course, that's correct. But what about the work that Christ is doing for you right now at the right hand of his Father? Again, it's Solivianus in the firm foundation that really makes clear what a blessing, what a comfort this is. I quote from him directly. Christ also appears forever in heaven. He doesn't take a holiday. He doesn't take a day off. Christ appears forever in heaven before the face of the Father with, please note this, the very body, very body and soul in which my sins were fully punished and my salvation was obtained. Thus I may be assured that every hour, yes, every minute, the Father has before His eyes the guarantee of the once and for all eternally valid sacrifice of Christ. Still the words of Livianus, I may also be assured that He does not demand any payment for any of my sins, which in the full severity of his divine justice, he's punished in his son. In other words, the very same hands that had the Roman spike nailed through them, those are the hands that are before the Father. The very same feet that were pierced by the Roman nail are before the Father. The very same body that was pierced by the Roman spear is now before the Father. And Olivianus says, think about that when you're praying. You may have your doubts. Does God hear my prayer? Does he not? Well, think of who is interceding for you. Not simply the Son of God and his divinity, but the Son of God who has taken upon himself and also suffered and died and risen in his human nature, that mediator is before the Father. He's taking every one of your prayers. But then, with that great intercessory work of Christ the priest, you expect that since by grace, through faith, we share his anointing, again we're going to have our work cut out for us. And thankfully, due to the previous speaker, I can greatly condense this section of my speech. Because really, when the Catechism says, Lord's Day 12, present myself as a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, that is the third section. Lord's Day 12, as Dr. Horton explained, Lord's Day 12 is directly connected in the priestly office to the whole third section of the Catechism. Obedience to the commandments, prayer is part of thankfulness. Now, I'd like to add but one thing. But this is not just our calling because we're Christian, but also because we're a priest in Christ. You know, when someone holds office, we expect and rightly so, something from them. If someone holds the office of minister of the word, we expect, and rightly so, that when he gets up in a pulpit, he's going to deliver the word of God, and not just all kinds of human opinions. If someone has the office of elder in the church, we expect that they're going to visit the people, that they're going to make good judgments. If they don't, we say, that's irresponsible. You have office. You have a task. Did you see that person in the mirror this morning? She was combing your hair. You have an office. You can't say, 
Well, today I'm going to take a little break from the Ten Commandments. You can't say today, I'm just going to put a pause on prayer. Every genuine believer is a priest. You don't take holidays from office. And so there needs to grow and mature in us a sense of official responsibility and accountability. I pray, yes, because I love the Lord, but also that's part of what it means to be a Christian priest. Well, then we come to the last, and that is king. Christ as our king rules through the sword of the Spirit. Remember I quoted there from Revelation 19? And to us, if you try to visualize that apocalyptic vision, it's, it's a little bit of a gruesome sight. We like to think about Jesus as very gentle, very kind, and then Revelation gets us out of our comfort zone and there's this sword coming out of his mouth. But not the sword of iron and military power and political dominance. No, it's the sword of the Spirit. This is the Word. And there is this, what I sometimes like to call the dynamic duo in the Catechism. That's the powerful combination of the Word and the Spirit, sometimes the other way around, Spirit and Word, but always closely together. You see, that's precisely how Christ rules. The Word and the Spirit. And that's why it also hit me as I was sitting there in of all places the Heilige Heiskirche the Holy Spirit Church and also reflecting on the speech that I would deliver the next day. And there was not one reference to the Word of God in this church that's named after the Holy Spirit. How wrong can that be? But then, if we understand and we appreciate that Christ as our King does not just deliver and then depart and leave us to our own, but as King continues to rule over us, defend us, protect us by His Word and Spirit, then we'll also understand that we, sharing in His anointing, Perhaps I should have mentioned that at the beginning, but we bring it in at the end. We don't have a separate anointing. Lord's Day 12 says that we by faith share in Christ's anointing. Because He's the head, we're the body. It's all one anointing. If we share in the anointing of Christ as King, then we better be prepared as Christian kings and Christian queens to do a little bit of dueling. One point on the tour, we learned about how they would duel off here in the forest, the swords and the fencing and so on. Well, I don't suggest that any one of us starts fencing metal swords, that a little bit messy. But to fence, to duel with the devil and the world and our own sinful nature too inside, with the sword of the spirit, you can't call yourself a king and think you can just keep on eating the fancy feasts. You've got to pick up the sword. There's no room for cowardliness in the threefold office. There must be courage, not in ourselves, but in our great high priest, king, and prophet, Jesus Christ. And let me then conclude with a few thoughts, in fact, two. Thought number one. Do we think too small of Jesus? Because Jesus is not just Jesus. Jesus, as the Catechism explains, Lord's Day 11, going on into Lord's Day 12, is Jesus is also the Christ. And now we've heard something of what that Christ all contains. And therefore, when people say, Jesus is my friend, good. But please don't stop there. 
Jesus is Christ. He's prophet, yes, chief prophet. He's priest, only high priest. And he's king, eternal king. There's so much more to who he is. Is that announced? Is that proclaimed? Is that believed? Is that assimilated? How small have we made the Savior? No, he's not small. He's grand. No, he's glorious. Literally, with weight. There is a weight of glory in the threefold office that is not captured in the way that many people speak about Jesus today. Let's not think too small of our Savior. Second, let's not think too small of ourselves as Christian. Now, as soon as I say that, I realize that could be misunderstood. So please, let me try to correct the misunderstanding. I'm not at all suggesting that we be puffed up about ourselves. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord, period. But what I am suggesting to you today is that our thoughts about the name, better title, Christian, is too small. We often just put it up against atheists or those who are agnostic. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. Therefore, I'm a Christian. And so I'm over here in this camp. Good. But that's only the ABC. That's only the one, two, three. There's so much more than that. Those who are genuine Christians are prophet, priest, and king, including everything that we've heard about And I wonder, I wonder if this would not help. With so many Christians who are trying to find a sense of purpose, a sense of fullness in life. Yes, I say Jesus is my Lord, but why am I here on this earth? What am I supposed to be doing in And all the things that I do, do they really count for anything? Anything of substance? Okay, I make some money, but money is money. And maybe I maybe I even write a book, but how many books are there in the world? What is the real lasting purpose of everything that I do? And some some people really struggling with this, they they almost slip into a bit of a spiritual depression and they say, I'm just just a worthless Christian. I still want to be called a Christian, but I'm just a worthless, almost useless Christian. Is it worthless to be a prophet? Is it useless to be a priest? Is it meaningless? Is it, is it empty to be a king? I should say not. The Church of Christ, which is the assembly of true believers, Belgian Confession, is an assembly of prophets, priests, and kings. And it's high time that the members of the church were both comforted, encouraged, but also challenged by this truth summarized in Lord's Day 12. Thank you.